Father, we come before you. Again, it's always better to learn at someone else's expense. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to understand the warnings that are composed in this book from Ezekiel to your people. When we stand before you, Lord, our hope is to hear one day, well done, good and faithful servant. Good, the nature of the work. Faithful, the nature of the servant. Servant, the expectation of the person who was using their gifts. Just wanting to serve the one who saved our souls. And so, Lord, keep us from the things around us that would pull us away from you. And as we talked about on Sunday, the cares and the anxieties of this world that will disrupt our very person and thoughts. Come, Lord, come and minister to your people as we seek to come before you and open your word. May we truly be changed. May the inside of our hearts be a place that you are pleased to dwell in. Thank you for all these things. And open your word now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, chapter 9 is, if you weren't with us last week, a bit of an abrupt place to start. So reminder, chapter 8, Ezekiel was in his house with the elders of Judah sitting before him. Suddenly there was the appearance of one, like the his appearance of fire from his loins even downward and from his loins even upward, the appearance of the brightness. Chapter 8 is the color of amber. And he put forth the form of a hand and took me by a lock of my head and the spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door at the inner gate. And then he said to me, Son of man, lift up your eyes now to the north. Verse 5. So I lifted up my eyes and I saw northward at the gate of the altar, of the image of jealousy, this image of jealousy in the entry. And he said, Son of man, do you see, verse 6, what they do? Even the great abominations that the house of Israel commits here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary. But turn, I'll show you greater abominations. And so then he brought me in and showed me a door and a wall and told me to go in. Verse 9. And I went in and I saw, verse 10, creeping things and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the walls round about. And there stood before them the 70 men of the ancients who helped to rule over the nation of the house of Israel. In the midst of them I stood Jazaniah, the son of Shaphan. Every man with his censer in his hand and a thick cloud of incense went up. And then he said to me, verse 12, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark where they think no one can see them? Every man in the chambers of his imagery or within his heart. For they say the Lord seeth us not. The Lord has forsaken the earth. And then he said, turn yet again, you'll see greater abominations. And he brought me toward the north gate of the house. Toward the north there were behold women weeping for Tammuz in verse 14. And he said, have you seen this? I'll show you greater abominations. In verse 16 brought me to the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, the door of the temple between that, the porch and the altar were 25 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they worshipped the sun toward the east. Which way do synagogue doors face? How many say Israel? Very good. In Israel, which way do the doors of the synagogues face? Towards Jerusalem because of the temple. Very good. Just reviewing from last week. See if anybody still had that. If not, now you have your Bible trivia answer again. They have filled the land with violence. So I will deal with them in my fury. Verse 18. My eyes shall not spare, neither will I have pity. Though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, yet I will not hear them. So this is what was going on, not only up publicly, externally, but in the hearts of the people. Remember, they were there at Mount Sinai, burning with fire, Pillar of fire by night, pillar of cloud by day. They've crossed the Red Sea on dry ground. We found evidence of it. They go through the Lord feeding them manna every day. And there, as these things are happening, they said, all that the Lord has said we will do. They heard the voice of the Lord speak. You shall have no other God before me. You shall not make unto you any graven images. Shall not bow down unto them. Lord, your God is a jealous God. So they heard there is no other God but him, make no graven images. And at the root of the problem, now that's happened to the northern and southern kingdom, is they 
got interspersed and, and mixed with the nations around them and the nations that they had refused to completely drive out, got caught up in their idolatry, the licentious worship that was part of that, and eventually they became even more corrupt than some of the people that they replaced, even though God had spoken to them in a way that no other people had had. And so again, to whom much is given, much will be required. And in that backdrop, now there's a complete turning away for most from the Lord. And so chapter eight was Ezekiel's indictment against them being shown from the Lord. And now chapter nine, he's seeing it epitomized by this group of men who go through, but what will eventually be sent to the Southern kingdom are the Chaldeans. And the Chaldeans or the Babylonians will come in and they will eventually breach the walls and they will take those in the city and many will die by the sword and you know the famine and the pestilence and then many will be just captive, ta taken captive and pulled away and taken off and some sold and others basically put in prison, etc., etc. So this is what's going to happen. So in chapter 9, as Ezekiel's seeing this, this vision of Jerusalem and what's happening, now God shows him again sort of a depiction or vision of that coming judgment. So it was awfully hard to just leave that halfway through, but we ran out of time. So now chapter 9 follows immediately after chapter 8. There he is seeing the city of Jerusalem having been taken up by the lock of his hair. And he hears the Lord saying, I will deal with them also in my fury. My eye will not spare. Neither shall I have pity, though they cry in my ears with a loud voice. Yet will I not hear them. And so chapter 9 we pick up. And so he cried also in mine ears with a loud voice saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near. Every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate with lieth toward the north. Now, obviously, more than six came in with the Chaldeans, but this is representing what's coming. Six men came in from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north. And every man had a slaughter weapon in his hand. God is giving them over to their enemies is what's ultimately going to happen. Their protection is leaving. And one man was among them, was clothed with linen, with a writer's inkhorn, inkhorn by his side. So basically you have an accountant in the midst of them or somebody who's going to note what's going on. So six men with their slaughter weapons and then one with a linen garment with a writer's inkhorn by his side. And they went in and they stood beside the brazen altar, the place where sacrifice for sin would be made to cover their transgressions. And under the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant of the law, when you sinned, you needed a sacrifice. That sacrifice covered you until the next sin. You've heard of that thing that happens every year. It's called Yom Kippur, and they had it every year. And every year the high priest went in first with blood for his own sin, and then he would go in with blood for the sins of the nation. And every year they'd have to do another day of atonement because every year they'd need another sacrifice to atone for the sins of the nation. And every year they would go in for Yom Kippur. But then after Jesus came, died, and rose again, not long after that, the entire sacrificial system would be taken apart and destroyed by the Romans Think about it. After Jesus has come, died, and risen again, not long after the whole sacrificial system is removed, it's almost as if you didn't need it anymore. How many are following me here? This is the book of Hebrews. We have a better covenant, the new covenant in Jesus' blood. We have a better high priest, the Lord Jesus himself, who is after the order of Melchizedek. We have a better sacrifice, not a blood of a ram or a bull or a goat, but the blood of God's own son. We have a better covenant, better savior, better mediator, better sacrifice, better resurrection, so you better listen. That's the plan of Hebrews. Here, he stood by the brazen altar. We went through this recently in 1 Peter 4, 17. Where does judgment begin? At the house of God. Where is this judgment in chapter 9 beginning? The house of God. God often first deals with his people. See, if you don't correct your own kids, it's awfully hard to speak to the neighbors. So it starts first with the house of God. So here are these six men with their slaughter weapons in their hand, and one among them clothed with a linen garment, with a writer's inkhorn by his side. Often the priests would be in linen, so again, could be priestly representation. One day we'll know for sure we see it in heaven, but obviously faithful to the Lord. 
And so he was there with the inkhorn by his side. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar, chapter 9, verse 3. And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub. So the glory that Ezekiel saw in chapter 1 and in chapter 2, and we'll see again in chapter 10, this glory of God now moving, pulling away. Never a good sign when God's glory begins to pull away from a place of ministry. So the glory of the Lord, the God of Israel, was gone up from the cherubim. Whereupon he was, verse 3, to the threshold of the house. It's sort of like he's leaving. And he, the Lord, called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for what? For all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. What's happening? Oh, we just read it. Yes, but what's happening? Before judgment comes, who is God basically setting aside? Those whose hearts are broken over what they see. So those who are just overwhelmed by the sin of the nation around them and in many ways feel helpless. They know the truth. They try to share the truth. No one wants to hear it. They're watching their whole society sort of slide off a cliff with each new news, you know, news update or whatever it may be that comes their way. They sit there and they go, oh, God, when, how long? And he says, go, you find those who sigh and who are crying for the abominations in the city and you put a mark on them. Now, often when we think of people receiving a mark, what do you usually think of? The Antichrist. You're not wrong. However, let's go to Revelation for a minute because there's still a true mark of God in Revelation. That's chapter 7. Let's look there. You see, Satan counterfeits. How many figured that out? He wants to be like God. He's not God. No matter how hard he tries, he'll never be God. And when he tries to go head to head with God, his angels can't even beat God's angels, let alone him beat God. It's no contest. Unfortunately, genius borders insanity, and he's quite intelligent and also quite insane, quite powerful, but yet only created. But in chapter 7 of Revelation, yes, the last book of your Bible, far right turn. After these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow in the earth, nor in the sea, nor in any tree. And another angel was ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000 of all of the tribes of the children of Israel, not Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, just in case you can't figure that out, he gives you verse 5 after it. Just in case we missed it. Of the, 12, of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000, Reuben 12,000, Gad 12,000, Asher 12,000, Naphtalim 12,000, the tribe of Manasseh 12,000, Simeon 12,000, Levi 12,000, um, Issachar 12,000, and Zebulun 12,000, the tribe of Joseph 12,000, the tribe of Benjamin 12,000. So just in case you weren't sure that it was 144,000 Jews, he goes through different tribes by name, giving each 12,000 so that you will know it's 144,000 Jews who follow the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, wherever he goes. So during this time of judgment, there are going to be 144,000 Jews, specially marked by God, who are witnesses for the Messiah. Jews. Look at chapter 9 of Revelation. The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit, which you learned of in Peter. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there rose smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and un unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. Again, like an as, giving us our best description he can. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God from chapter 7 in their foreheads. So there is an honest seal of God for his people that protect them. 
Look at Revelation 13. Satan, of course, coming along, always has a counterfeit. How do we know? Well, he takes partial truths and manipulates them, promises wisdom and knowledge, doesn't deliver. <coughs> promises fulfillment, brings in the bondage. In fact, anytime usually you see bondage, it's associated with evil. Pornography will bring you into bondage. Drug, drug addiction will bring you into bondage. And when you find yourself X equals bondage, usually it's evil in the kingdom of darkness. Because every time you interact with Jesus, he said, we'll know the truth. The truth will set you free. Very simple rule of law to just look at which way is this, where is this from? Bondage, darkness, light, freedom, Christ. But in Revelation 13, the Antichrist is the first 10 verses. Then verse 11, here's a false prophet. And we find out that he causes all, verse 16, both small and great, so I'm included, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark, a false seal. In their right hand or on, and in their foreheads or on. And no man may buy or sell, save that he has the mark of the name of the beast. How many now are paying attention to the social credit system in China? How many are now seeing it after I mentioned just how people can't get airfare, they can't get you know, fast trains, they get slow trains, they get denied even being able to, to get certain jobs. There's already in place in parts of China a system where if you are not a good citizen, you jaywalk, you don't clean up after your dog, whatever, they drop your score down. If you drop far enough down, you essentially become an untouchable. That's in place now. There's a system coming where if you don't you know, cave in and take this mark, you're completely excluded. You cannot take care of your family. That's what's coming. No man can buy or sell, say they take the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. So there's also a false mark that will come one day. On your way back, stop at Timothy. I'll tell you which one as soon as I catch up to it. It should be 2 Timothy, but I think 2. Verse 9, 2 Timothy, oh, 2.19, my fault, 2.19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knows them that are his. That's an encouragement tonight, isn't it? If you've opened your heart to Jesus by faith, you've asked for his forgiveness. You can say from your own free will that you believe with all your heart. He rose from the dead. He paid for your sins and he is your savior. Not the savior. He's your savior. And this verse is for you. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal. The Lord knows them that are his. And the other side of that coin, so let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. He goes on to give us some encouragement. Back to our chapter. So there is this seal that they're to write on the heads of those who sigh or who are crying over the abominations that are being done in the midst thereof. And this seal given by God in Ezekiel 9 verse 4 sets them apart from judgment that is to come. So set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others, those other six with their slaughter weapons we learned of in chapter 9, he said, in my hearing, go ye after him throughout the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. And the Babylonians will not spare. They'll come through and just wipe out. Again, this depicting what's coming. Slay utterly young and old, the Chaldeans will do that, both maids and little children and women. And come not near any man upon whom is the mark. And begin at my sanctuary, because judgment begins at the house of God. And then they began at the ancient men which were before the house, these 70 ancients which were before the house. And he said unto them, defile the house and fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth. And they went forth and slew in the city. So now Ezekiel's getting sort of this depiction of when the walls are breached and the Babylonians come flooding in. And it came to pass while they were slaying them. And I was left that I fell upon my face and cried, Ah, oh, Lord God, Ezekiel overwhelmed. Will you destroy all the residue of Israel in thy pouring out of the fury of thy fury upon Jerusalem? And then he said unto me, the iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great, and God has to judge sin. He's holy. He has to be consistent with himself. These are the attributes of God. He's merciful. He's kind. He is love. But he is also justice, 
holy, righteous, and he will bring forth judgment against sin. And so for God to satisfy his own nature attributes, he himself has come down, borne our sins and the wrath they deserve, so that he could then be just to forgive your sin, dismiss your case, because he himself has paid for your sin and your penalty. So God takes our iniquities upon him so that his wrath and his justice and his righteousness are satisfied. And he is the one upon which they were satisfied in your place. So now he can extend you his love, his mercy, his redemption, and his forgiveness. Without Jesus, there is no bridge between men and God. He is the one who has reconciled us back to himself. He's made that payment. So Ezekiel cries out, will you destroy all the residue of Israel and pouring out your fury upon Jerusalem? And he said to me, the iniquity of the house of Israel and of Judah is exceeding great. The land is full of blood. Where does that leave our country? We could start just with the unborn. If you have been involved one way or the other in abortion, ladies, gentlemen, you've come to Christ, you're forgiven. But if we don't find our voice with some of the rules they're passing in some of the states, we're going to lose it as a society. If we can't protect them, who can we? The land is full of blood, the city full of perverseness. For they say, the Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord seeth not. Things have changed. God doesn't care, because if he did, where's the judgment? You ever heard that one? Just wait for it. And as for me also, my eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. But I will recompense or repay their way upon their head. I won't ask you what you deserve if you were to do your laundry list, but I know what I would deserve, and I'm grateful for Jesus. And behold, the man clothed with linen, which had the inkhorn by his side, reported the matter, coming back to the Lord, saying, I have done as thou hast commanded me. And so this is what Ezekiel is seeing unfold, the fall of Jerusalem and sadly the slaughter that will come from the Babylonians because they departed from the Lord, so his protection was removed and now they faced the desire of the Chaldeans to take their land. So then I look, chapter 10, and behold, in the firmament, that's again the expanse or what we call in, chapter, in Revelation chapter 4, the sea of glass, we saw it in Exodus 24 with the elders of Israel seeing an expanse above their head. We saw it in Ezekiel chapter 1, chapter 2 where the cherubim were flying below this expanse. We got a chance to go up on top of it in Revelation chapter 4 and see the sea of glass where the 24 elders are around the throne of God. The living creatures are bowing down before him. That expanse, that firmament. I saw the firmament that was above the head of the cherubims. And there appeared over them as it were. What does that mean? His best attempt to describe, as it were, a sapphire stone, again, like a lapis lazuli, kind of a blue, blue sort of bright stone. As a sapphire stone, as the appearance, as, as it were, as, of the likeness, it's not that he's from Southern California, he's doing the best he can, he's not like-like, he's just, this is close, I can get it for you. Sapphire stone, as it were, as the appearance of the like, kind of like a throne, see? And God was on it. And he spake unto the men clothed, or man clothed with linen, and said, Go in between the wheels, those terrible, awesome, huge, sort of impressive wheels that are within wheels that have, we learn, eyes in them, and there's this glory and burning presence of God. And so he said to the man in the linen garment, Go in between the wheels, even under the cherub, so they're falling around near the cherubim, and fill thine hand with the coals of fire, from between the cherubims. Go ahead and just go grab them. What is that? Well, that's why we're here, Pastor. You want, we want you to tell us. Turn to Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28. When you get into Ezekiel 28, which God willing we will eventually, we talk first about the prince of Tyre, the local ruler, Verses 1 through 10. Then we get into verse 11. We talk about the king of Tyre, the power behind the rulers of Tyre. But as we begin to look at this individual that is mentioned, clearly it's not an earthly king, which I'll show you as we look at it. He said, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, verse 12. Say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, You seal up or you complete the sum, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. 
You have been in Eden, the Garden of God. Did anybody read in Genesis 3 of the King of Tyre and Garden of Eden? Me neither. What human beings were there? And? That's it. What angelic beings were there? Satan, who is a fallen angel, and eventually who would get dispatched to guard it? Cherubim with a flaming sword. Good. Now we've covered who was there. Clearly, this is not just a regular king. You have been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardis, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, the emerald, carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes, we'll talk about when we come back, was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. He's only created. You are the anointed cherub, which means he has hoofs like a calf, that covereth. And I have set you so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. There they are. He had access to it. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created until iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence. Thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. He's losing his access. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities and by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore, I will bring forth a fire in the midst of thee. It shall devour thee and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. And all they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. And thou shalt be a terror. Never shall you be any more. Um, listen, little, little heart to heart to those who are Satanists. Your team loses and they go down in flames. It always boggles my mind that they're Satanists, but they don't want to acknowledge God. Uh, well, who made the devil? Well, he made a God, he, God made an angel named Lucifer who sinned and became a fallen angel, now people know as Satan or the devil. He is a created being. You are following a corrupted, really deceived, so deceived he thinks he can fight God and win. None of you would ever be that deceived. And he's going to lose, he's going to lose in flames, and yet they're still following him. And he'll use them as a tool, Satan, and when they're no longer useful, he just puts them to death one way or the other through their pleasures, their, their pursuits, their drug abuse, their whatever. So he puts them in this wicked, decadent lifestyle that's part of Satanism, does horrible damage to them. If you've ever met people who've been caught up in Satanism. And then when he's done, snuffs them out. Meanwhile, if you turn your heart to Jesus, ask him to be your Lord and Savior, ask him for his forgiveness. Even if you've come out of Satanism, he'll forgive you. He'll fill your heart with the Holy Spirit. He'll work in your life. He'll give you joy. He'll give you peace. And when the day comes, he'll bring you home and he'll crown you and put you in his kingdom. What a difference. But they can't see it. Because as it tells us in Corinthians, the God of this age has blinded the minds, the hearts of those who don't believe. There is a literal devil. And he does deceive and he does blind. And if you really don't think he doesn't exist, you have not read the news. Back to Ezekiel. So that firmament was above the head of the cherubims. It appeared over it as it were a sapphire stone, the appearance of the likeness of a throne. And so he said to the man clothed in linen, go in between the wheels, even under the cherubim, and fill thy hand with the coals of fire, which seem to be some of the same things referenced in chapter 30, 28. From between the cherubims, so he, had, excuse me, pardon me, excuse me, can I, hold on, coming through. That's interesting. He's got to move his way through the cherubim. Get these coals of fire from between them and scatter them over the city. So in this case, let's think about this. Heaping coals of fire, is that bringing a blessing? No. Proverbs 25. Left turn. Proverbs 25. There's a number of interpretations, and so I'm not going to solve all of this for you, but I'll at least point this out. It says, if your enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat, verse 21. 
If he be thirsty, give him water to drink, for thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. Now, some feel it's showing an act of kindness, because if it's, it's hard to get a fire started, you give him some coals, he takes it home in a little pan, and he can heat his home, possible. Others say the Egyptians did it to show a sign of repentance, possible. Could also be by someone who was doing you harm, you showing him kindness, God one day is going to say that that's part of the judgment. I had my people around you. They showed you kindness. What did you do to them? So it could be coals of fire and judgment. I'm just pointing that out because here when coals of fire get heaped together and sent down, it's in judgment. You'll see it also in Peter, but, or, um, oh, let's see, I hate when I do that to myself. Sorry, waiting for it. We were in Proverbs. Uh, Romans, sorry, 1220. You'll find it there also, referencing from Proverbs. So go, grab the coals of fire from between the cherubim, scatter them over the city and its judgment. And he went in, in my sight. Now the cherubims stood on the right side of the house when the man went in and the cloud filled the inner court. Again, the cloud of God's glory. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house and the house was filled with the cloud, and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. Again, much like when Solomon dedicated the temple in 1 Kings 8, also 2 Chronicles 7. And the sound of the cherubim's wings was heard even to the outer court as the voice of the Almighty God when he speaketh. I know what you're thinking by now. Pastor, yes. Papyrus and parchment was very expensive, right? Absolutely. Copying it very slow and laborious process, very expensive. Absolutely. Couldn't God have just said, hey, my glory left. Two verses, done. How many get it? We have all this chapter of wheels and coals and description and going in and wiping out and people being sealed. And why this sort of slow departure tour here? How many of you love hanging out with a really good friend? Let me see. Okay. Um, do you just go like, yes, yeah, you buy, and you're out of there. What do you find yourselves doing? Okay. Yeah, I got to go. Hey, did you see the other day? Yeah, I saw that. Okay. Now this time I really got to go. Okay. Okay. This time I really, really got to go. Do you, you have that kind of relationship with someone? The fact that this departure, very descriptive and also sort of methodically moving out, it's almost like it pains God to leave people he loves. Just an observation. This could have been two verses. God lays out a whole picture. So the sound, verse 5, of the cherubim's wings was heard. It was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. The wings were heard even to the outer court as the voice of Almighty God, that's El Shaddai, when he speaketh. And it came to pass that when he had commanded the man clothed with linen, saying, Take fire from between the wheels and from between the cherubims, that he went in and stood beside the wheels, which again, we still don't know exactly what they look like, but they sound awfully impressive. And one cherub stretched forth his hand from between the cherubims, they're all packed together somehow, unto the fire that was between the cherubims, that's traveling with them. And took thereof and put into the hands of him that was clothed with linen who took it and went out. So somehow he's physically able to handle this thing. That's something else we'll learn about in heaven. And there appeared in the cherubims the form of a man's hand under the wings. That's twice now he's telling us there's a hand in two verses with the cherubim. Something just gets his attention about it. Here's this wing and out comes his hand. There appeared in the cherubims the form of a man's hand under their wings. When I looked, behold, the four wheels by the cherubim, one wheel by one cherub, and another wheel by another cherub, and the appearance of the wheels was as the color of a barrel stone, so sort of a yellow, topazy, goldenish kind of color. As for their appearance, they four had one likeness, as if a wheel had been in the midst of a wheel. Again, we think perhaps perpendicularly, we'll know for sure when we get to heaven. When they went, the cherubim, or the wheels, sorry, when the wheels went, they went upon their four sides. They turned not as they went, but to the place whither the head looked of the cherubim, they followed it. They turned not as they went. Didn't we already learn this? How many have been with us since chapter one? Did we not already learn this? He's telling us again, why? Because he's just going, man, is this different. I just can't get over it. They, they don't turn. They just move. And one, one, the cherub, and wait, but if the cherubim have four faces, they don't, they, they just look all the time. It's not like they have to, they can check all their blind spots at one. Yeah, we're good. Move. They have four faces. 
Well, I'm just trying to make it practical for you. We were driving down to see a brother in the hospital in Virginia on Monday, and we're following along this car. It has this two big dogs in it. One big kind of, I don't know if it's a Great Dane or what, but we're at a stop sign, and I realized the dog goes, the dog is checking the blind spots. I'm like, you got to be kidding me, right? So we, of course, it took a long time to get to the next stop sign, but I actually got video. They came up to Route 10, and the dog kind of gets up, looks, looks around, and the driver pulled out. I'm like, the dog is that? You wonder what happened to that dog in the past, and it's actually looking and checking. But I have this great show. I sent it to the kids, like, check this dog out. He's actually looking at blind spots. Back to our text. So, toward the place whither the head looked, they followed it. And they turned not as they went. Perhaps only one of the faces sort of have command and control. We'll find out when we see these things in heaven. And their whole body and their backs and their hands and their wings and the wheels, their body, their backs, their hands, their wings, and the wheels were full of eyes round about. Now that's something new. We didn't hear that the first go round in verse 1 and 2. How do you take that in? What is it signifying? If you can see everything, then you're what? All seeing or omniscient. So what are they depicting of the glory of God? He sees everything. He's omniscient. These things are full of eyes round about. And apparently, as he describes it, it's quite different to you and I. But Ezekiel doesn't say, and gee, it was creepy or anything else. He just says it's just the way they are. And to them, that's normal. There's a thought. How many eyes do we have? You may have two, you may have one, you may have two, but they don't work, whatever your case may be, or they kind of work. As you get older, they work less, so your glasses get thicker, or you get multiple glasses like some of us, or whatever the case may be. But here's a simple object lesson to consider. They're full of eyes, we have two. You get a sense they have a better sense of God? Just, just go with you know, simple math. More eyes, less eyes. More understanding, less understanding. You think about just, just two for surface area of our bodies compared to cherubim covered in eyes. Clearly, we have a lot to learn about them. Just a simple observation. I'm also grateful I'm not covered in eyes because that would be pretty tough. I mean, think about it practically, really. Imagine you work out like the desert or, you know, or dust or... You people don't sit around and think about these things? <laughs> Imagine if you're a cherubim, you have to wear contacts. I mean, like, you know, I'm sorry, I just, I, that's the kind of brain I have. <laughs> Nothing worse when you're, you know, look me in the eye. <laughs> I'm just trying to help. They have four faces. Again, here we go. Their whole body, verse 12, their backs, their hands, their wings, and the wheels, and the wheels were full of eyes round about, even the wheels that they four had. As for the wheels, it was cried unto them in my hearing, O wheel. Now, it, once again, simply, the normal word would be O fan for wheel, just the simple word for wheel. But that's not the word used here. It's actually gal gal that's used and it speaks of sort of the whole whirling or wheel working or moving of machinery. So not just that's a tire. This is the idea of like drive train or interlocking gears kind of moving or movement among wheels. And so the idea of a wheel whirling kind of moving constantly sort of in rotation perhaps. A wheel it was cried to them and everyone had four faces again, which is why if they're all looking in different directions, it'll be clear when we see it. The first face was the first face of a cherub or an ox. The second face was the face of a man. The third face, the face of a lion. We learned this before. The fourth face, the face of an eagle. And yet they have on their wings, on their whole body, on their backs, and on their hands, eyes. Very interesting. Clearly otherworldly. And the cherubims were lifted up. This is the living creature that I saw by the river Chebar. So now he's calling them cherubim. He's letting us know I've seen these things before. They were involved with the glory of God. But now this whole entourage of God's glory is leaving and leaving God's temple. And so when the cherubims went, verse 16, the wheels went by them. When the cherubims lifted up their wings to mount up from the earth, 
The same wheels also turned not from beside them. Again, what we saw in chapter 1 and 2. When they stood, these, the wheels stood. When they were lifted up, these, the wheels, lifted up themselves also. For the spirit of the living creatures or creature was in them, the wheels. Then, most importantly, the glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubims. So now the glory of God is beginning to leave. And the cherubims lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight. When they went out, the wheels also were beside them, and every one stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house. And the glory of the God of Israel was over them above. This is the living creature that I saw under the God of Israel when they were below the firmament by the river of Chebar in chapter 1. And I knew that they were cherubims. Everyone had four faces apiece. Everyone had four wings. And the likeness of the hands of a man, here it is again, under their wings. And the likeness of their faces was the same faces which I saw by the river Chebar, their appearances and themselves. And they went, everyone, straight forward. So chapter 11. Moreover, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me unto the east gate that looketh toward the Lord's house. So he's turned, looking west, looking straight through the door of the temple. Turning around 180 degrees, he would look east through the eastern gate. He would look through the Kidron Valley up to the Mount of Olives, up to where Christ would ascend to return to the Father. The Spirit lifted me up, brought me unto the east gate of the Lord's house, which looketh toward the east. And behold, at the door of the gate, five and twenty men, here they are again, from among whom I saw Jazaniah the son of Azu, and Peltiah the son of Benaiah, princes of the people, again leading them away from the Lord, then said he unto me, Son of man, these are the men that devise mischief and give wicked counsel in this city. You know, God knows who's trying to divide churches. God knows who's trying to undermine missionary work. God knows those who are trying to stir the pot in parachurch ministries, Bible studies, among the body of Christ and so dissension. He knows. Well, why doesn't he do something about it? Because first he gives what? Time for us to correct ourselves. God knows who's trying to take you out at work and trying to undermine your performance in front of your boss. He knows. You may actually have the wrong person in your mind. He knows. And he can handle it. So just draw close to him. Let him be your defense. He'll do it. These are the men that devise mischief, that give wicked counsel in this city, verse 2, which say, it is not near. You know what? We're not going to be judged by the Babylonians. Sure, we've had deep, two deportations, but that's enough, isn't it? It's not near. They can't even see the reality in front of them. Let us build houses. Do you remember Jeremiah told them and Ezekiel told them, hey, you're going to be in Babylon for a while, 70 years. Build houses. Marry your sons to daughters. Marry your daughters to other people's sons. Build, plant, take root. You're going to be in time out for a while. That's what they were told through Jeremiah and through Ezekiel. The people refused to believe it. They don't want to believe God's word. They want to take what they want from God's word, and they want to reject what they want from God's word. And that happens all the time today. So they're saying, nah, not going to happen. We're not going to be judged. We're going to stay here. We're going to build houses. And now they're mocking what Jeremiah was told. They say, in this city is the cauldron and we be the flesh. We're not leaving. We're staying. We're not going to be chased away. So much for Jeremiah's boiling pot pouring over from the north and taking us out. That's not going to happen. We're going to stick around. Verse 4. Therefore prophesy against them. Prophesy, O son of man, these false prophecies. And the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me. And he said unto me, Speak, thus saith the Lord. Thus have you said, O house of Israel... For I know the things that come into your mind, every one of them. Oh, how many of you are comforted by that? <laughs> well, come on. How do we know Ezekiel's not just reaching here? Fine. Turn to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. That's another one we've got to bring out of the oldies and sing. David writing said, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. He knows you this evening too. He loves you anyway. Desires a relationship with you, which you must do through faith in his son. 
You know my down-sitting and my uprising. You understand my thought afar off. Sometimes he knows your thoughts better than you do. So if you're having problems remembering him, ask him for help. It's a wonderful thing as you get older. Thou compassest my path and my lying down, and thou art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue or my mouth, but lo, O Lord, thou hast known it all. Do you even know what I'm going to say? Well, then why do we pray? I knew you were going to ask that. If he already knows what I'm going to say, why do we pray? Simplest example. How many of you are parents? That's it? Okay. Obviously, within limit, how many, as long as it's not negative, harmful, etc., how many of you would do anything for your kids? Hopefully all the hands that were still up before. Do you not know what they're going to ask you at times? Yes. You do know, don't you? I mean, when they come into my office, I know they want M&Ms or they want to show me artwork or they, whatever it may be or somebody's in trouble or whatever it is. But I still love to hear them ask. And even when I've, I've like, I don't have a lot of time, I'll say, look, Dad's got to get a lot of things done. What's on your monkey? Thank you. And, uh, but even when I've got to get, get back to it, I still love to see them and hear them. Usually I have enough time to scoop up, for example, Whitney, give her a big hug and all that, talk to her, find out what's on her mind, then send her out. She's just coming down just to show me she can write Janie. And you kind of go, that's great. <laughs> Glad you told me. He already knows what you're going to say, but he loves to hear you talk to him anyway. You see, God created man. Not that God needs anything. He's self-sufficient. But he created us out of his own desire to have fellowship. He doesn't need your fellowship, but he desires your fellowship. But for him to be in fellowship with you, a holy God cannot be in fellowship with sinful people. That comes under again his wrath and judgment. So because he desires to be restored to his creation, or have better, more importantly, his creation restored to him, he set forth from before the foundation of the world the plan where he would send his son to redeem us. Everyone who died before the death and resurrection of Jesus looked forward to a work of God. They may not know his name, but they knew God was going to make a way for them. They died in faith. And all of us look back. Now we know his name. His name is Jesus, the son of God. But we're all looking at the same thing. God has to save us. And we trust he's going to bring us back to himself. They died in faith. And so that redemptive work of God brings us back into a relationship with him. And he loves to hear us call upon his name. He loves to hear us sing his praise. And he doesn't get tired of it. And he knows what you're going to say before you say it. But it's still you come to him in faith. You tell him what's on your mind. And he begins to work according to his will in your life. Well, it just it sounds like a waste of time. Couldn't he be more efficient? How many of your parents? Do you always do the most efficient thing or do you sometimes drag your feet to kind of keep the, enjoy the moment with your kids? Oh, look, there's bonus features. Let's watch those. You hang out with them. There's not a word in my tongue, but you know it all together. Verse 5, 139. You have beset me from behind and before. You surrounded me. You've laid your hand upon me. Beautiful thing to know God's hand is on your life when you come to Christ. Such knowledge, David said, is too wonderful for me. It's high. I cannot attain to it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Whither can I flee from your presence? If I ascend up into heaven, obviously we'd expect this, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, Sheol, the center of the earth, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning, if I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall your hand lead me, your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from you. But the night shines as the day. Nothing's hidden from him. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. You have possessed my reins. You have covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and thou sowest thou my, that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from you. This is before ultrasound. When I was made in secret... And curiously wrought in the lower parts of the earth, lowest parts of the earth, thine eyes did see my substance being yet unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, in which continu um, continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! God's thinking of you. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Surely they will slay, surely thou will slay the wicked, O God, and depart from me. 
Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, you bloody men, for they speak against you wickedly, and your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? Am, that I, am I not grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way of everlasting. God knows. So back to Ezekiel. They're saying, you know what? The city, nah, we're going to build houses. Cauldron will be the flesh. Prophesy against them. So the spirit of the Lord fell upon me. Thus saith the Lord to the house of Israel. I know the things, verse 5, that come into your mind. David talked about it. Every one of them. You have multiplied your slain in this city. Again, in their own murderous ways. You have filled the streets thereof with slain. So since you seem to like it so much, I'm going to let the Babylonians come in and finish the job. I'm going to give them what they want. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, your slain whom you have laid in the midst of it, they are the flesh, and the city is the cauldron. But I will bring you forth out of the midst of it. So the city will be consumed. You're going to be departed. Some of you will go to the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and into captivity. You feared the sword, and I will bring a sword upon you, saith the Lord God. I will bring you out of the midst thereof and deliver you into the hands of strangers. Again, their, their protection is left. And we execute judgments among you. You shall fall by the sword. I will judge you in the border of Israel. That's very important. They took him to Hamath, to Riblah. And that's where Nebuchadnezzar passed judgment. Remember when Zedekiah tried to run away, go through the wall, head down towards Jordan, cross the river, go over towards um, the country of Jordan to us today, or Moab. They were captured. They were brought to Riblah. He killed all his sons in front of him, killed some of his, his princes in front of him, gouged out Zedekiah's eyes, and then took him off to Babylon in chains. He was literally judged at the border of Israel. So Ezekiel here prophesying, and this will come to pass, as he said, I will bring you forth out of the midst of it. I will judge you in the border, verse 10, of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord. This city shall not be your cauldron. You're leaving. Neither shall you be the flesh in the midst thereof. But I will judge you in the border of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord. For you have not walked in my statutes, even though they promised they would. Neither executed my judgments, but have done after the manners of the heathen that were round about you, which God warned them not to follow in Deuteronomy 12, 30. And it came to pass that when I prophesied, as Ezekiel saying this, this has to be a bit tough, that Palthiah, the son of Benaniah, died. Now look, I've put plenty of people to sleep preaching. Thankfully, so far, no one's died. We had one person go down with a heart issue one time, but praise God, by the time they got to the hospital, they couldn't figure out what was wrong with them. That was long ago at Montgomery School. You imagine you're just proclaiming the word of the Lord and people start just... Boom, boom, boom. He died. Then I fell down upon my face. Please see Ezekiel as a man like you and I or a person like you and I who would be devastated to see this. I fell upon my face and I cried with a loud voice and said, Ah, oh, Lord God, will you make a full end of the remnant of Israel? And again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, thy brethren, even thy brethren, the men of thy kindred, your own family and household, all the house of Israel, holy, are they unto whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, Get you far from the Lord. Leave this place. Get away from the Lord. You leave us alone. Unto us is this land given in possession. That's why I read Psalm 139. Where exactly can you go to get away from God? And yet there may be some listening or watching later, you've been running from God. The good news is if you are listening or watching later, he's catching you. <laughs> you ever run from God? How many, how many before you got saved, you could sense that God was convicting you? You started running, right? Wait, wait, wait. I mean, wait, I gotta, if I get saved, that means I got to get out of this and get out of that. And, hmm, uh, hmm, and you start running. And the funny thing is, he's everywhere you turn. So they're saying, get out of the city. We're going to keep it. Get far from the Lord. Just leave us alone. There's verse 16. Therefore say, thus saith the Lord God, although I have cast them afar off among the heathen, and they will be scattered, 
And although I have scattered them among the countries, yet will I be to them as a little sanctuary in the countries where they shall come. In other words, I'll still be with them. They were unfaithful. God was. Therefore say, thus saith the Lord God, I will even gather you from the people and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. And they will return after the captivity. They will come back to Jerusalem with Ezra. Eventually, Nehemiah will come and help as well. They will build the second temple. As they lay the foundation of that temple in Ezra, it tells us that the old men who saw the first temple of Solomon, they were weeping because it was nowhere near the glory of the first one. But the young men who grew up with this hope, waiting for a captivity to end, waiting for God's promise to restore them back to the land, they seeing the foundation stones in the, ba the base of the temple being laid, they were shouting for joy because at last God had been faithful to his people to bring them back and to let them again rebuild now the second temple. And the people surrounding there in Judea and Jerusalem, the people surrounding the Jews couldn't figure, what's going on? Because they heard laughing and cheering and weeping at the same time and said, those Jews are really bit odd. They can't make up their mind over there. That was happening in Ezra. When Solomon dedicated the first temple, David was given the blueprints. David took much of his spoils of war, saved them, set them aside for the Lord. Solomon added some to it. But all Solomon basically had to do is get it quarried off site, show up and put it together. He left them the puzzle. He gave them the location. He gave him the building plans, gave him a lot of the material, gave him the, the coordination, command, and control of those who would help oversee it. Solomon basically just had to put it together. When Solomon prayed, first, Second Chronicles 6, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, cry out to God, what did he say? I'll heal their land. That's in the movie. Chapter 7, as he finished praying, the Spirit of God came and the glory of God filled that house. When they built the second temple under Ezra, in Ezra chapter 6, verse 16, they finish. But we don't hear about the glory of God filling it. We also don't hear about the Ark of the Covenant coming back or being placed in the Holy of Holies. Most feel, and I agree with those who feel this opinion, the Ark of the Covenant disappeared before they went to Babylon. Most feel Jeremiah hid it. We'll know for sure when we get to heaven or just give it a little time. It may show up even in our lifetime from where it's been stashed. There are those who claim they know where it is. But that second temple did not have an Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies, according to historians and Jewish tradition. And interestingly enough, did not have that presence of God at least mentioned in Scripture when they started that second temple. But yet there was a prophecy. Malachi 3.1, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the bearer of the covenant whom you delight in. So the glory of God delayed, but eventually the glory of God truly did come into that second temple as he rode in on a donkey, went in and cleaned out the money changers, overthrew their tables and drove out those who sold animals and said, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer. You've made it a den of thieves. And after that, the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. And then the children ran around crying out, Matthew, Hosanna to the son of David. And the religious leader said, do you not hear what they say? Or do you hear what they say? And he said, yes. And have you never read that out of the mouth of babes, you have perfected praise? Wait a second, Jews in Israel, where does praise belong? To God. Who are they praising? Jesus. Well, then who is he? The glory of God did come to the temple, but not as they expected. Now, we will get to the end of Ezekiel, and we will be shown by Ezekiel the third temple. And Ezekiel sees again that manifestation of the glory of God, this time returning to the temple. That is still to come. Interesting. Thus saith the Lord, I will gather you from the people, verse 17, the assemble you out of the countries where I have scattered you. I will give you the land of Israel. They shall come thither. They shall take away all the detestable things. After Babylon, Israel was pretty much done with idolatry. That was once you go get saturated in it, you've had enough. Therefore, in all the abominations thereof from thence, 
And I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you. What's this? This is the new covenant. Mm. We're out of time. Yeah. I didn't even read a news article. Well, clearly we're picking up there next week because we can't just run through that. All right. Father God, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your love, your mercy. They have so much ready to build a third temple. They're just waiting for it. They think they have a red heifer. We'll know for a fact in about a year and a half. If that turns out to be kosher, as we say, now we have what is needed to sanctify the implements to begin the sacrificial system. We're right on the edge. This is no dress rehearsal. This is for real. You and I sit in this room knowing the truth. May God give you boldness and a joy that would cause people to ask the reason for the hope that's in you. The day of our redemption is drawing way near. And while we have the opportunity, help us to be light and salt. Thank you, Lord. Strengthen your people. And if there is anyone who doesn't know you, history is on our side. Archaeology is on our side. Textual evidence is on our side. Prophecy is on our side. The empty tomb and the historical documentation of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is on our side. So why not open your heart and come join us on our side? Thank you for the love of God given to all who believe. Thank you for this evening in Jesus' name. Amen.